Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I have an anthology coming out called Moms Don't Have Time 2, a quarantine anthology. And it comes out on February 16th and has essays by 60 plus of the authors who have been on this podcast. So first of all, please pre-order this book. I think you will love it. I'm so excited about all the authors who are represented. Um, Just to give you a few, um, Chris Bajalian, uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes, Ashley Prentice Norton, Gretchen Rubin, Rima Zaman, Eileen Zimmerman. And that is just from the first page of the multi-page table of contents. So please pick up this book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology. It's available anywhere you buy books, Amazon, bookshop.org, and your local independent bookstore. So please pick up a copy. And also, I want to invite you listeners to my um, fundraiser slash launch party the night it comes out on February 16th, a Tuesday at 7 p.m., Bookhampton and the Children's Museum of the East End are co-hosting it for me. And 50 of the authors who wrote essays in this book, as well as many of the amazing authors who blurbed this book, um, who wrote little praiseworthy quotes at at the front, will be there. And you can be there too. So if you go to my website, zibbyowens.com, and just click on Anthology and go to Book Tour, you will see um, a whole fundraiser section. And for $50, um, you can attend. You'll get a copy of the book, and you'll get to schmooze on Zoom with all of these amazing authors. This is like going to be the literary happening of February. So please come. I would love to see you all in person on Zoom, I guess, but even see some of your faces. I know so many of you are really loyal listeners, and that makes me really happy. All proceeds of the book and the fundraiser are going to the Susan Felice Owens Program for COVID-19 Vaccine Research at Mount Sinai Health System. And it is named after my husband's mother, who passed away from COVID over the summer, which many of you followed along on Instagram as I uh, recounted that horrific experience. So all the proceeds are going there. The cost includes the price of a book. So thank you for supporting this effort and for supporting my book. I can't wait to see you there. Today's episode is brought to you by Page and Pairing. Page and Pairing is the weekly email that brings you book wine, and recipe recommendations, plus exclusive perks like author interviews and essays, music playlists, and writing tips. Sign up for free at pageandpairing.com. And if you're tired of wondering what to read, drink, and cook, Page and Pairing does it all for you, dropping all three into your inbox. Books are definitely better when paired with great wine and delicious food. So Page and Pairing is the weekly email that brings you all three curated for your pleasure and dropped in your inbox. Again, sign up for free at pageandpairing.com. Caroline Gertler is the author of the middle grade novel, Many Points of Me. A former children's book editor, Caroline has an MA in art history and gives tour of old master paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Caroline grew up in New York City and lives on the Upper West Side with her husband, two daughters, and dog Dash, which happens to be one of her favorite forms of punctuation. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me, Zibby. I'm really excited to be here today. I feel like it was not that long ago that Sarah Linowski introduced us and we sat next to each other at the library lunch and you told me about this book you were working on. And now here we are and it's coming out many points of me and it's in my hand. And this is so exciting. Yeah, I'm excited. I can't, I actually can't believe how fast it's happened. I remember being at one of your events and you announcing to the room that I had just had my book go out on submission and Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, that was, that was really nice because it led to a really nice conversation with some writers after. So it was really sweet of you. And you're such an amazing supporter of authors and books. And I just, I love watching what you do. No, your really helped get me through some of the pandemic and the quarantine. So thank you. 
Oh, I'm so glad. And I really felt like we were all going through that submission process with you because you told me like the day you sent it out. And then like every day I was like worrying and wondering and, you know, seeing you in the halls at school. And I don't know, I, it's a nerve wracking process knowing it's out there and does the timing of hearing matter and all of that stuff. So yeah, we were like all flies on your shoulder in that event. So sorry for <laughs> blasting your anxiety out to the crowd. It's kind of like, I kind of wish I could re-experience it. It was just, now that it's come out to, you know, a published book, I can say it was, it was enjoyable. <laughs> Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning. So when did you start writing at all? And then let's just go from there. I'm someone who's wanted to be a writer my entire life. Like since I knew what it meant to be a writer, I would say certainly by the age of, I taught myself to read at like three or four, I had two older sisters. So all the learn to read books were around the house and I just picked them up and never stopped. And I think my first diary that I ever wrote when I was nine that I kept, I have an entry from when I was six, but I wrote that I wanted to grow up and be a writer and have two girls and a dog. And wow, (laughs) my husband's like, where was the mention of the husband? And I'm like, well, you know, but the other, (laughs) it's all means to an end. (laughs) Means to an end. (laughs) Wow. That's impressive. Sort of, what is it when you like will something into happening? I don't know. Anyway, I'll think of it. (laughs) Prophesying or something. It's hard work. It was sort of willing it to happen that I had to work and work. It didn't come fast. I mean, I thought, you know, oh, by the time I'm 20, by the time I'm 25, and now here I am in my early 40s and I just kept working and working and working. And so I think that's what made it happen. It wasn't just a childhood dream. It, you have to work to make it come true. hundred <laughs> percent. Very true. Yes. This is, I was not trying to suggest that like the heavens just flew down the book deal for you or anything. So you knew you wanted to be a writer as a child. And then tell me about some of that hard work that led us to this book. Well, I guess just, you know, years of playing as a child and just writing stories and reading. And then I think for a little while, I sort of moved away from it thinking, oh, I could never become a writer. And so I looked into journalism and I thought about other things and art history. So I went and I did a degree in art history. And then at a certain point, I decided, you know, books are really my thing. I had done an internship in college for a children's book editor. And when I, after I finished my art history master's degree, I actually moved, I was in London, I moved back to New York and I started looking for jobs in publishing. And while I was doing that, I actually got a temporary job working at the bookstore at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They were hiring seasonal temp workers for the holiday season. And so I was there, which was an amazing experience. It was my first exposure to being sort of on the staff side of the Met and got some internships and curatorial departments. And I was just applying for publishing jobs. And then I got my first one with Christy Ottaviano at Henry Holt, who I had interned with when I was in college. And I spent a few years working for her and Wendy Lamb at Random House. And I think that was kind of like my MFA, like learning about how to write and being on the other side of publishing. It's just writing on the side and practicing and working. And how did you choose what audience to write for? Why write for younger readers versus adults or how did, or was it just for this specific book? I think I was thinking to write for adults when I was younger, like in college, I took writing class with Mary Gordon. And so I was writing short stories, but I always was writing about children and childhood and my absolute favorite period as a reader, like that time from like eight to 12 reading middle grade novels was such a rich experience. And I, just the way those stories made me feel. And then I think also when I got the internship in publishing in college, I had applied to a children's book editor and then also to an adult uh, publishing internship. And I went for both interviews and above and beyond, I just fell in love with the children's book world. And I think that's sort of how it came to be. I think that for a while in my 20s, I maybe was still trying to write adult stuff. And then actually when I was like 24 or so, I think I took my first class in writing for children at NYU with Amy Hest. And I think that's when I sort of focused in on really trying to write for this audience. Wow. And let's talk about how your experience at the Met ended up informing this book, because there's so much of that in it and the art world and drawing and the famous artist and all of it. So tell me about deciding to use that, those bits and pieces of your professional life for the backstory or not even the backstory, but the whole setting and everything of this book. (laughs) 
Well, I think, first of all, I loved from the mixed files of Mrs. Basley Frankweiler as a child and the idea of, you know, having some sort of behind the scenes access to the Met was really spoke to me. And there've been a few other books that have done it nicely, Masterpiece by Elise Broach, which I actually got to help work on when I was at Henry Holt. And then Under the Egg by Laura Marks Fitzgerald was another really good recent one. And so I wanted to write something that was like an ode to the Met and sort of drew on my art history background, my love for art, for the place, for New York City. So I think that's really where it came from. And then I was just intrigued by the idea of what would it be like to be a kid whose father was a famous artist and who died and sort of left behind this legacy that is visual that people see and have exposure to, but like doesn't necessarily speak to what the actual personal relationship was. And so that was the other part of it. Yeah, that was so interesting how you went into the whole discussion of how you refer to artists in the present tense, and yet they've passed away. So in a way, it's keeping them alive, right? Like he is a, right? Isn't that Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly like the first line of the book, which is a line that sort of stayed through several drafts. And then I had actually taken out that line, I think, in one of the fi- towards the final drafts that I was working on with my editor. And then I finally was like, I want to put that line back in. And I put it back in the beginning. And I'm glad that I did because... I'm glad you yeah. did too. That was a, no, because it's, it, it's kind of makes you think right about the whole and what it means when somebody like if some, if you've lost someone and it's up to you to bring back their memory, right? Like if you think of them or items trigger them or something, that's one thing, but it's another thing to have somebody who you're constantly being sort of resensitized to, if that's even right, you're, you're exposed to it. So your trauma keeps coming back up and you're lost, but not even because of you, right? Mm-hmm. Like my grandmother, I can see her sweater and be sad, but you know, the famous artist here as the dad, like you can't get away from that. So yeah, it's a very interesting conundrum, the sort of private and public spheres of loss. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is interesting and I'm sorry for your grandmother and I, I no, yeah. no, no, I didn't mean to bring it in. I mean, most people have lost it. No, no, I, yeah, I might, I, I've lost one grandmother, but the one I'm really close to, which I can say is luckily still with us, but I, I my heart goes out to you. I, Oh, thank you. Oh, it was very sad. But <laughs> so tell me about the writing of this book and knowing your daughters and your life and everything <laughs> firsthand. When did you do it? Was it when they were all at school or wh- how did you structure your time? How long did it take to write and all of that? Well, I am the most undisciplined person that exists. And as Sarah, our common friend Sarah Monowski can testify, she was so key in helping me to like sort of settle down and like find that discipline. I met her on a plane to Montreal, like when my older daughter was just starting kindergarten at the same school that her daughter went to. And she w- we actually ended up spending 10 hours together in the airport because our flight was canceled. My husband was already up there and she was going up for the holidays. And so she kind of, she and her husband took me under their wing. I was with my two girls alone traveling and like helped us all get up to Montreal. <laughs> but then after that, we started meeting at a coffee shop right after drop off. And like, she would just make me sit there in a place with no internet and just write. Like she would be like, okay, just sit down and write for an hour. And of course we had many wonderful conversations too. And she'd be like, stop talking now and write. <laughs> but she really helped me get into this mode of doing that. And after that period, I started going to the New York Society Library on the Upper East Side after dropping my younger daughter at nursery school. And I just, I just made myself do it. I was like, I just have to go and I'm not leaving here. I knew what time I had to go pick up my daughter. I was like, I'm not leaving until I get out this number of words. And I just kept going. So it was a lot of discipline for someone who's not disciplined, which is hard to do. (laughs) Yeah. I think your story just there negated your claim that you are not disciplined (laughs) because you clearly are. But I think having a friend or having accountability of some sort is so key. And I'm jealous of you. I wish Sarah still lived on the East Coast, but I'm jealous that she was the one because she's such a champion and cheerleader. And to have somebody in your corner who believes in you and wants you to like do your work, that's so awesome. I mean, that's really amazing. I was very lucky. And I also had a writer's group that sort of disbanded slightly now, but I would be meeting with them once every other week. And so sort of having that accountability and knowing that I could check in with them was helpful to, to keep me going. And in those times when I just got so down and thinking, this is never going to go anywhere. I'm never going to be able to finish. I don't know what to do. Like, I wish it's, it's just very helpful to have writerly emotional support and find those people. Very true. And do you draw? I know there was a lot in here about different types of art forms <laughs> and all the rest. Are you an artist at all? at all? I know you say no, but... <laughs> Maybe a little. No, no. I mean, I love visual arts. I love textiles and fabrics and visual 
things, but I'm not, I cannot draw. And I remember like in college meeting someone who like, he runs a drawing center or something. And he was like, everybody can learn how to draw. Just close your eyes and like, you know, draw what you see. And of course I just, I don't know. I'm sure that it's like, never say never. Anybody can do it, but I'm just not talented that way. And it's like, it's, I think there's a parallel with, with writing that I think is really interesting. It's just that that difference between what you have in your head and then actually putting it onto the page. And so I have no conception of how you'd go about that with a piece of art, like how you would, I mean, capture something figuratively, I guess, abstract, I could try to do, but even then, you know, I just don't have it at that vision, but like the, with writing, I understand, you know, from the inside out, how it works or how it, that feels to be able to have this vision in your head and then put it onto paper. And you don't, and, and everyone who writes like knows like what initially comes out is nowhere near close to what you envision in your head. And even the final product is never really what you had in your head, but you work and work and try to get it there through all the tools that you have as a writer, which you get better at by practicing them. <laughs> That's true. The artist has all their equipment they can line up, right? All the brushes and the colors and everything they need. And then writers, it's all sort of the transition from head to fingertip in some way. And that's it. You all your thing, all your tools are your hands. I always get so worried like whenever I slam my finger in the door, I don't know, all these ridiculous things where I'm like constantly getting hurt or something's hurting or whatever. And I'm like, what if I couldn't use my hands to type? <laughs> right? I feel like not only is it like our primary communication method now, at least for me, I like rarely pick up the phone, but also just to get my feelings out of my head. And it would be like, so I don't know, it would be like devastating to not be able, and now I'm like jinxing myself. I know. But, right? I, I mean, just having this. But. I actually, well, two things. I have a friend who has arthritis. She got arthritis at a young age and has that issue. So uh, that she has a hard time typing. But also I just think it's so interesting how we've grown up. Like I learned to type in like fifth or sixth grade, like just sort of on the cusp of when computers were becoming common and just how my thinking is so attached to typing on the keyboard and being able to like hit delete and move and cut and paste. And I I don't write well by hand and just how different that is. I always admire when I hear writers who are still writing their first drafts by longhand. I'm like, that's, I I physically, like my hands are not strong enough. I don't have a good pencil grip. Like it hurts me to write. (laughs) So I just, I, I kind of think there must be something very special about writing it out by hand first and then translating that onto the computer when you don't have the time to like fidget with every word. Yeah. I used to write by hand like ages ago, right? Like 10 and under or something, but, or maybe even a little bit further, but now I just feel like it's so much faster. Like my, I can't write as fast as I'm thinking. So it's just so frustrating to like wait for the pencil to catch up. I don't know. This is so, 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 so silly. <laughs> for some writers who are like, like writers that I admire that are very beautiful writers, like they do write, they probably are writing more slowly and more deliberately because they're not just, you know, I'm a speed writer. I, I'll be like, I'm going to sit down and punch out three pages and I can do it in 15 minutes, but it's mm-hmm. not always as well thought through as it would be if I slowed down and took some time with it, maybe. <laughs> so. Yes. I'm not good at slowing down in pretty much anything, but good point. Well, having been through this whole process and getting it published, having it coming out into the world, which is so exciting, what advice would you have for young writers? You, you know, years ago, <laughs> starting on this journey. I think that, I mean, the, the big things are just keep reading so that you learn story and internalize a sense of how story and plot and character work. I think that's, that's something you just learn by reading a lot and writing, just practicing, just doing it and you know, having fun exploring different worlds. I don't know how important finishing a project is. I sort of had this conversation with an, another writer friend who teaches writing to young children. I never was really great at finishing things when I was a kid and even well into my adulthood, which I think eventually becomes a very important feat. And I remember the first time I finished something, it didn't matter if it was good or bad. But I think when you're young, you know, you, you're, you have so many ideas and it's okay to just keep exploring them. And actually my daughter, my almost 11 year old daughter writes, and it's so fun to like watch how she, I mean, she's like way better than I ever was or ever am or will be at like thinking of like plot and character and motivation, like all these things that I can like consciously think about. She can like talk through it and it's amazing, but she doesn't, you know, she'll write like a hundred pages of something and then move on to something else. And I'm like, is it important for her to finish at this age or just, 
you know, get it down. She was like asking me about like copyright rules. She wants to quote from like, wow. you or something. And she's like, well, if I want to have them acting a play, can I use the actual lines of dialogue? And I was like, well, don't worry. Like, unless you're being, unless you're publishing it, like, you know, you could just have fun and use it. And if you do get to the point of publishing it, then, you know, we'll figure that out. But it's fun to sort of have that in the house, like this kind of person to have these talks about writing with. and That's amazing. Wow. If a kid of mine could finish a page, that would be like <laughs> a miracle. But <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Some of them like writing more than others, but none of them are writing a hundred pages and worrying about copyright infringement. So <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Did writing about all of this enhance your appreciation of art? Like, do you have a favorite room in the Met that you really love? Like, do you now feel more attached to it having sort of just had it in your consciousness for even longer? I think that came from my, I'm a docent at the Met. I give tours there. So I've, for the past 10 years, you know, done volunteer training and we used to have volunteer training on Mondays when the Met was closed to the public. So I got to spend a lot of time there when it was closed. And I think that's really where my love for the Met kind of has solidified that it feels like my own backyard. There's so many things I love. I love the period rooms, which I think I mentioned in this book, you know, that you feel like you're walking through like a giant dollhouse. I mean, the American rooms are amazing too. Of course, I love European paintings, which is my field. I'm especially a fan of 17th century Dutch art. And they've they've had a a special exhibition on it for the past couple of years as they're renovating the European paintings gallery. So they're all gathered together in one place and I could just live there. But there's so many wonderful places to explore. And it's funny when I go with people to the Met, I'm like racing through, like I know I could like cover the whole Met in 10 minutes because I used to give a tour of the whole museum and people are like, what, where are we? You know, and I forget that like not everybody is as comfortable. Like it doesn't have the whole floor plan of the Met like living in their heads. So it's a really special privilege to be able to have that relationship with such an amazing place. I have that with the Museum of Natural History because all four of my kids took class there like for several years, each child. And we like had to tromp through every single thing. And anyway, I did that so class with Elizabeth actually. And uh, oh yeah. So there you go. I've for years, like I'm <laughs> anyway, I actually, the asterisms in the book, like the stuff about the dad painting stars and he painted the series of asterisms. I learned about asterisms from the natural history class that we did last year. Uh, And this year we were doing even more like astrophysics and learning even more about stars. And I was like, oh, I wish I had had all this information last two years ago (laughs) because we are going a little deeper now. I know. I'm like, as I go from child to child, I'm like, can I remember the answer to these questions? (laughs) From like, you know, one time it was a six year jump. So I was like, okay. All four of them were. Yeah, I did it with all four of them. I'm always amazed at those parents who are there with like four times a week with each one of their kids. Oh, no, I never did more than two times a week, but yeah. And Dutch art, I love, I took a class in college. I took art history every semester, but I didn't major in it because I only wanted to take the ones I wanted to take. And there was this amazing class by Christopher Wood, who's this mm-hmm. like preeminent scholar on Dutch art. I'm sure. Anyway, he was amazing. And so I hear his voice every time I'm tromping through exhibits and things like that. Anyway. Well, Caroline, thank you so much. It's so exciting that your book is coming out. I'm excited to do the event together at Shakespeare and to have this book. I started reading it out loud to the kids, but then I couldn't read it fast enough to them for the pace that I wanted to read it. So at least they got a few pages, but it's really awesome. And I'm so excited for you. It's really fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Libby. This is fun. And I'm looking forward to our event. And I'm also looking forward to your books coming out next year, your anthology and picture book. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> That'll be fun. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thanks to pageandpairing.com for sponsoring today's episode. Go check them out, pageandpairing.com, the weekly email that brings you book, wine, and recipe recommendations. And just a reminder again, please pre-order a copy of my book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology, and go to my website under the anthology tab for the fundraiser, and I hope you'll buy a ticket and join me for, and I should have mentioned um, all proceeds go to COVID-19 research. So please join me for the fundraiser. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time To Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 